got asked about humidor eyes. There's a lot of questions this week um, that are a bit uh, political. Um, what's my view on humidor eyes? Do I think it's right or wrong? The the thing for me is it's the interpretation. The interpretation is important to me in the sense that somebody, for example, this is something that happened in the UK. A guy coming out of prison and is going to be deported pushing for the rights of a family life under human rights because he's got a cat. Now that may, that story may or may not be true but it was pushed around on the media but it's a prime example of how it's pushed one way. The fact is to annoy people that human rights are being exploited. The other side of that is refugees and what, what I call illegal transients um, where it's also exploited, but the media cover it in a very different way because they'll say these people have human rights. They do not recognize that the human rights aspect has already been covered. Uh, for example, if you leave a war-torn country and go to a neighboring country that is safe and you're not going to be attacked, hurt or whatever, that's the obligation. Not to go to Germany, not to go to the UK. The obligation was met by going out of the war-torn country and being able to move to that location for safety. Um, that's a prime example where they'll promote that these people have human rights and should be able to go to the UK or whatever. No, no, there is no connection with the UK. There's no connection with most of Europe. Um, it's not an automatic right and it's certainly not a human right. Where you will also have some things that are dis disenfranchised, manipulated, misused, is things like, I know I get uh, frustrated about the fact that the UK has penalised British people over the fact that Tony Blair's little open border policy uh, with the EU, the freedom of movement, um, which he could have blocked but chose not to. I'll just turn that volume down. Um, gay freedom of movement to Europe, the UK border force, etc., cannot do anything about that. And obviously, the Brexit will have some impact on that. But the only people that could target was actually British people. They don't want to target students, students bring in too much money. Um, but what they do target is British people with foreign pam uh, families foreign wives, foreign, foreign kids, etc. And they target them in an aggressive manner. Um, now, is it a human right to separate the family? The answer to that is it's an economic one in most cases. Economically, you're better off in the UK. It is not a right or passage to move your entire family automatically to the UK because this is exactly how the UK started locking some of this stuff down before. It's just got worse and worse because obviously the open border policy, but the people getting married 12 times or whatever um, and get paid thousands of pounds just to get the, the foreign husbands into the UK, those days are gone. But that's exactly why these sort of things were brought in. And then obviously now we've got the EU situation where people complain there's too many uh, EU citizens in the UK or settling there or whatever, um, the reality to that is that it's not a human right, it's a, it's a legal right. It's not my human right to say that my family should ha be allowed to go to the UK automatically, it's a legal one, um, it's a legal issue. But at the same time, there is nothing separating because I could move to the Philippines and they did. Um, and now obviously we moved to Spain, but the, the point being is you can make that move if you wanted to. The separation of the family is often not actually a human right because it, it, there is a choice there. It doesn't matter if you like it or not, that's the realities of it. If your husband's from Nigeria or whatever, economically Nigeria is not in the same state as the UK and financially you're not going to make as much money but it's not a human right to say that you should have that financial access to keep you together that the, the person should travel from the other country it's an economic one it's a, a political one 
It's a legal one, but it's not human right. They're very different. Um, and that's the problem I have with human rights. Is you cannot say, are you for or against human rights? You have to understand that it's a case-by-case -case basis because other way is interpreted. So if you're asking me about human rights where I would actually say, where would I use it? I would say if the stuff that's going on in Syria right now is actually proven about these attacks um, using chemicals, then that would be a human rights violation. Now, under that human rights violation, I would also ask for a campaign and an investigation into if any of those chemicals had actually come from the United Kingdom. And if they had, look into the businesses and politicians that were involved in that and take them to a human rights court. Now, that's where it should be used. And that's the sort of place that will never get used because obviously those little political arenas are kept very quiet. They'll, they'll be kept legally hidden for probably the next 50 to 100 years. And then when they're already brought out, the people involved will already be dead from an old age. Um, but that's where human rights should be used, but it's not. Too, many, too often it's not, let's put it that way. It's all right going after people from their own country. It's all right to go after Assad. For example, that's fine. That's fine. The UK media will push that. US will push that. But you know what? We say, hang on a minute. Let's roll this around a little bit. Who sold them the stuff in the first place? Uh, no, let's not talk about that. Now, if, a little bit of a clincher on this as well. The whole Syria thing is not so cut and dry as people make out. For me, it's actually to do with a pipeline relating from Iran to Iraq, to Syria, to Europe. Um, this is why Russia's got a lot of interest in it as well, because that pipeline also means that the Russian pipeline to Europe is under threat, because it's got a competitor, and this is why it's being opened up. So, bearing in mind, when a country's at war, getting that work done is very, very cheap. You can cut those deals. Look at Afghanistan, and look at the pipeline related to that, and who ended up as president. Very similar. But anyway guys, thanks for watching, but that's my view on human rights. Very cut and dry in the sense that you have to decide if it is human rights or not. And often it is not. It's more a case of economic reasons, legal reasons, or quite simply people not liking what they, they've got. Myself, like I said, I mean I'm in the same th <coughs> situation. If we wanted to move to the UK, we could actually move to the UK already. We could do that anyway. but. As I've said before, myself, I couldn't care less about the UK uh, in that sense because I've disconnected myself from it. Um, life's better here in Spain. The kids will be are happier here. We have a better environment. It's a healthier environment. Um, warmer climate means sports facilities. And the education system. I would have to say that... Taking aside all the maths and all that sort of stuff, which is difficult to do a real comparison on um, at a young age. Where you have, the kids have a benefit is they have a lot of things like going to castles and things like that, where the UK has become such a nightmare to do the paperwork and the number of people involved. and it, it becomes very difficult to do that in the UK, where here in Spain it's a regular thing. There was a lot of sense of community here, and I do know in the UK it exists because when my daughter was it's in a primary school, for example, there's a strong community there. To the point is the school should have actually closed years ago, but it's actually funded privately, even though it's a government school. The reason being is there is no budget to pay for the school, so it's actually paid for by the friends of the school. Um, because very, I think there was only 64 students, but it's a village school, you see. Um, but there you've got a sense of community etc. But a lot of the UK now has become very silo and that, that, that's one of the big problems. I noticed that myself even living in Worcester. Um, you speak to your neighbours once in the blue moon. We actually are a lot more social how, out here in Spain and the Philippines are a lot more social as well. It's, it's just the way things have changed over the years. UK people are often busy but 
one of the things I noticed over the years in the UK, you're often busy doing stuff that is not needed. Um, what I mean, like, like doing a sawn, statutory off-road notification. All it is is a taxable piece of paper because they already know if your car's on or off the road. They already know. So the bit of paper does not actually value anything. It, all it just means is that they've got a record of this actually occurring that your vehicle is off the road, you've officially signed it's off the road. But if they found it on the road, they're going to prosecute you anyway. They're not going to go, well, you wrote a saw or whatever. They don't, they don't care. They want to prosecute. They want the money. Um, so like that, it's a piece of paper that it's just part of bureaucracy. And I know there's a lot of bureaucracy in Spain, but I find once you're in it, it's not really a problem. Uh, but things like the TV license is something you've got to remember in the UK. The council tax issues that people face. I remember my dad... <clears throat> There, there was a, there was some holiday that the council did, um, and the thing with that is the, they were closed for two days, and this was on the Thursday and Friday. My dad was going on holiday for the next two weeks, so his payment was late because he couldn't actually go in and pay it because they were actually closed. And then they demanded a year in advance when he went in. And he says, you know what? There's no... <laughs> do, you know, do you know the funny thing is? I don't think this is even legal. I don't think they have that legal right to do this in the first place. And I do recommend people have a look at some of this stuff. Because this is the big problem in the UK. It's pushed that you must do this and must do that. But often it's not legal obligation. Um, but anyway. So they didn't, he's always paid it like a week ahead or whatever. For the last 12 years, um, it's always been in advance, but it was just that that period where he was going on holiday, their own offices were closed, and it's my father's fault for not knowing they were having training days, two training days, that they hadn't really put anywhere else, but you couldn't actually pay for it. Like that, it's a perfect waste of time having to do all this stuff. I know a lot of this is moving online, but if you have a look at even going through the tax system, they often want you to do your own self-assessment, and you go into the websites. Like me, with my, even with Carillion, with my company car, they did not remove the company car. I had to manually do it myself, and end up with a rebate for me for my tax of a thousand pounds of overpayments for a vehicle I didn't have, yet this is another administration thing where they're pushing it on to you and that's what I find in the UK you do find you waste a lot of time on paperwork um, in Spain not so much um, I do think things like the Padron doing every three months is a bit of a pain in the backside if you need it but you know honestly if I was in here now where we are I probably have nothing to process for this year um, I'll have to pay the car tax, but beyond that, nothing. Healthcare is private and stuff, so that's all automated. Car insurance, automated. Um, the only one is the car tax, and that takes two minutes. The UK, is there's just a lot of bureaucracy, I find. I find myself. Um, but anyway, thanks for watching.